Canadian officials held direct bilateral talks at the highest level since Iran's revolution. Yet Iran and its nuclear program still present significant challenges to the United States and the international community. Nearly a year after President Obama extended a hand to Iran in his inaugural address, we have yet to see Iran unclench its fist. Instead, Iran continues to develop its nuclear program in the shadows. It claims that its nuclear program is designed for peaceful civilian purposes, yet it refuses to cooperate fully and transparently with the International Atomic Energy Agency and its inspectors. It raises significant concerns about the true nature and intent of Iran's nuclear ambitions. Last September, the United States, along with its allies, disclosed that Iran had long been building a secret nuclear reactor in Qom. Qom. This revelation was followed at, by last month by an official UN resolution condemning Iran's failure to disclose the site as required under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. The resolution was approved with strong international support by a 25 to 3 vote, with both Russia and China voting in favor of condemning Iran. There are many strong, there are many strong options, both within the United States and around the world, on how best to manage the, uh, the many challenges that Iran presents. I think that many of us support the President's strategy of engagement, but it, uh, if that fails to bear fruit, then a lot of us are contemplating what must be the next step, and that's what brings us together here today. We've assembled a distinguished panel of experts to share with us their thoughts on the vital national security question at hand. You know, I, I just on a personal side of this, you know, I just want to make a couple of points. I don't think that anybody uh, condones the fact that Iran uh, has nuclear weapons or is moving in that direction, and we think that uh, Iran with nuclear weapons is a major threat to American interest. It's a threat to Israel, a threat to peace and stability in the Middle East. Any program to which they may have a right as a party to the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty must be peaceful, civilian, open, transparent, and subject to inspection by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, disclosure of previously secret nuclear facilities, as we've seen, threatens to, uh, and a threat to replicate that ten times over. A general unwillingness to reasonably engage with the international community, obviously all of those behaviors by Iran cause concern. The United States and the international community has made, I think, a considerable effort to negotiate and engage that is yet to be reciprocated. That was a test for Iran's leadership. If it was serious about its claims that only a civilian nuclear program was being pursued, there was no reason it should not have agreed to export to Russia or elsewhere and allow the IAEA inspections. So what are our options? Governments and intelligence agencies and other experts uh, agree, uh, or disagree, I should say, on how close Iran is to developing a bomb. Also, many of them agree that any military strike on facilities would likely only de delay development by one or two years and cause other repercussions. There's considerable disagreement and debate on the value, effect, nature, impact, or usefulness of sanctions. Arguably, sanctions should be used to support, not replace, diplomatic efforts. Should Iran delay negotiations, or if the negotiations should fail, then many feel that a strong multilateral sanctions by the international community would be in order if they were targeted and effective in that regard. But now, with respect to the Iran Petro Refined Petroleum Sanctions Act of 2009, which the House will be considering this week, Personally, I have considerable concerns. The hardliners are in some disarray presently. New sanctions could allow them to consolidate their hold on power uh, and, bolster, and get bolstered support from the Iranian people. Sanctions could heighten support for Mr. Ahmadinejad out of some nationalistic feeling or resentment for how devastating the effect might, of sanctions might be on the civilian population. It's notable that the two main opposition leaders have spoken against imposition of uh, sanctions, particularly with regard to refined petroleum products. The restriction on oil products, refined oil products, could probably be assumed to affect uh, the poor and the middle class in Iran, but it's unlikely that uh, the elites and the guard in particular uh, would be deprived of the use of any gasoline or other uh, refined products that would come in, in fact, might control any market that existed in them. So we have a large question here to do. I think uh, Jeff and others may have a different opinion on that, but I could only support the IRPSA if I was assured that its current language, which I read to mandate the sanctions as opposed to provide the flexibility of the President to implement them, would either be delayed before any final passage to a more appropriate time uh, on the diplomatic pressure process that the administration is following, or if they were modified prior to passage to provide the President's more, uh, more flexibility.
If we get those assurances, then we may get it through the House so that it can go to the Senate and be uh, modified in a conference there if necessary. Only with more flexibility in exercising sanction authority might the President secure greater cooperation from our partners in taking effective action and ultimately facilitate a change in Iranian policies. Now is a critical stage in the intense diplomacy seeking to impose significant international pressure on Iran. I think the legislator ought to take care not to harm those prospects as they go forward. So it's with interest that we listen to our uh, experts on the panel here today. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we move in the, in the proper way, in the most effective way, and we welcome you and thank you for your testimony. With that, I defer to Mr. Flake for his opening remarks. I thank the Chairman. I, I look forward to today's hearing. Um, I, myself, am uh, not a fan of economic sanctions, uh, particularly those imposed unilaterally. And so it has to be a pretty high bar, in my view, uh, to, to, uh, to, to go this direction. I share the Chairman's concern about the uh, uh, refined petroleum um, sanctions. I, I note that there is not a virulently anti-American feeling in Iran among the population. And I hope we can keep it that way. And I am concerned about, uh, about changing that. Um, I, I think that uh, we can all agree and reading your testimony, I think we all agree that uh, the, these sanctions will only be really effective if they're multilateral, if we convince our international partners to come with us. My concern is, and my questions will be uh, surrounding uh, whether or not moving ahead uh, on a unilateral basis uh, is more likely to bring our partners along um, or if simply giving the President more flexibility in this regard uh, would be a better option. I, I, I hear all the time we're simply leading on this, we're simply expressing our, our feelings this doesn't tie the hands of the administration, but sometimes you don't start that way, but within months or the next year you're, you are uh, tying the hands of the administration. And I would uh, point to Cuba as a perfect example. Uh, when you have the Helms-Burton Act and, and other legislation, uh, the President's hands are tied. There are very severe limits on what the President can do in response to action on the part of the Cubans or in any other direction. And so while this may not start out as an attempt to tie the President's hands, uh, it may quickly uh, evolve into something that does, and, and that concerns me as well. So uh, thank you all for being here, and I look forward to the testimony. Uh, thank you very much. And I uh, ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, the Deputy Secretary of State's a letter to Senator Kerry, uh, on the uh, Chairman of the Committee on Foreign Relations of the United States Senate, on this issue. Uh, basically, the letter indicates that he's following up with a conversation that uh, James Steinberg, the Deputy Secretary, had with John Kerry, the Chairman of the Senate Committee, uh, regarding Iran and possible sanctions legislation to be taken up in the Senate. And that bill, S-2799, is very close uh, to the IRPSA bill that we're looking at here. Uh, the, the administration shares that Congress's concerns on Iran and its nuclear program and the need to take decisive action. One of the top national security priorities for the Obama administration is to deny Iran a nuclear weapons capability. As we discuss, we are pursuing this objective through a dual-track strategy of engagement and pressure. We are engaged in intensive multilateral efforts to develop pressure track measures now. It is in the spirit of these shared objectives that I write to express my concern about the timing and content of this legislation. As I testified before the Congress in October, it is our hope that any legislative initiative would preserve the maximum and maximize the President's flexibility, secure greater cooperation from our partners in taking effective action, and ultimately facilitate a change in Iranian policies. However, we are entering a critical period of intense diplomacy to impose significant international pressures on Iran. This requires that we keep the focus on Iran. At this juncture, I am concerned that this legislation in its current form might weaken rather than strengthen international unity and support for our efforts. In addition to the timing, we have serious substantive concerns, including the lack of flexibility, inefficient monetary thresholds and penalty levels, and blacklisting that could cause unintended foreign policy consequences. I have asked the Department staff to prepare for and discuss with your staff revisions that could address these concerns on timing and content, and I'm hopeful that we can work together to achieve our common goals. I hope the consideration of the bill will be delayed to the new year so as not to undermine the administration's diplomacy at this critical juncture. And I look forward to working together to achieve our common goals, and I will stay in close contact with you as the diplomatic efforts proceed. Uh, James Steinberg, the Deputy Secretary of State, and I ask it to be entered in the record with unanimous consent. So ordered. Now we'll receive our testimony from the panel before us today.
Uh, just give a brief introduction of our uh, witnesses as they appear on the panel. Dr. Suzanne Maloney is a senior fellow with the Brookings Institution's Sabin Center for Middle East Policy. Her work there focuses primarily on Iran and also on other Persian Gulf security and energy issues. From 2005 to 2007, Dr. Maloney served on the staff of the State Department's Office of Policy Planning. She has previously held positions with the Council on Foreign Relations and the Exxon Mobil Corporation. Dr. Maloney holds a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Dr. George Lopez currently serves as a senior fellow at the United States Institute of Peace, where he focuses on international sanctions and post-sanctions economies. He is also professor and chair at the Kroc International Institute rather, for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame, where he has taught since 1986. Dr. Lopez has published several books on the implementation of international sanctions, arms embargoes, and other non-military means of countering terrorism. Dr. Lopez holds a PhD from Syracuse University. Ms. Robin Wright also currently serves as a senior fellow at the United States Institute of Peace, where she focuses on Iran, the Middle East, and the broader Islamic world. Ms. Wright has reported for more than 140 countries on six continents for a wide range of publications, including most recently the Washington Post. She is also a regular contributor to Time magazine on the topic of Iran. Ms. Wright is the author of several books on Iran and the Middle East, including most recently, Dreams and Shadows, The Future of the Middle East. She holds a BA and an MA from the University of Michigan. Ambassador James Dobbins is the Director of International Security and Defense Policy Center at the RAND Corporation. He has held a number of positions in government, including U.S. Representative to the December 2001 Bonn Conference, where he worked directly with Iran in helping to reestablish a government in Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban. Ambassador Dobbins also formerly served as Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and a Special Assistant to the President. He holds a BS from Georgetown University. So thank you for all of our distinguished witnesses for making yourselves available here today. I know at least Dr. Maloney and Ambassador Dobbins have testified before the subcommittee before, so we welcome you back. Uh, it's the policy of this committee to swear in all witnesses before we begin our testimony, so I ask that all of you please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. The record will please reflect that all of the witnesses ans answered in the affirmative. And I tell you what I think you already know, that all of your written uh, statements will be entered on the record by unanimous consent. Uh, we try to limit the testimony to about five minutes, if possible, so that we'll have time for questions and answers after that. And uh, Dr. Maloney, if you'd be kind enough to start with your testimony. Thank you very much, Chairman Tierney, Congressman Flake, and the members of the committee for this opportunity to discuss the prospects and implications for sanctions. Could you please, influence I'm sorry, could you please pull that microphone closer? Of course, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss the prospects and implications of using sanctions to influence the behavior of the Islamic Republic of Iran. I will summarize my testimony, uh, which has been submitted in longer written form. But I find it uh, predictably ironic that less than a year after the Obama administration began its efforts to engage the Iranians in a comprehensive diplomatic dialogue, the discourse in Washington and around the world has already shifted toward an enthusiastic embrace of punitive measures. The, the search for alternative mechanisms for influencing Iran is completely understandable given the current context, both in terms of the increasing crackdown within Iran, as well as R R Iran's repeated rebuffs of the offers of the Obama administration and the rest of the international community to engage in a serious dialogue. At the same time, I think it's uh, unfortunate that the track record for sanctioning Iran is really not an auspicious one, and the key prerequisites for a successful sanctions-oriented approach protracted duration and broad adherence are almost certainly unattainable today with respect to Iran. There are some more promising indications of a more conducive context, but that is no guarantee of success. In my testimony, I'll speak briefly about that track record, but I will conclude by laying out a series of principles that should guide our consideration of any new coercive measures. We've had 30 years of U.S. unilateral sanctions on Iran, and there should be no illusions that the likelihood of a more rigorous and more broadly implemented sanctions regime will produce a reversal of Iran's nuclear calculus quickly or easily. 30 years of sanctions have not accomplished their primary uh, objective, which is the moderation of Iran's security and foreign policy. This has largely been a function of the lack of international consensus. Moving forward today, despite tough talk from various European leaders and the new cooperation between Washington and Moscow on Iran, the prospect for expanding the playing field on sanctions will still prove daunting, largely because of our di divergent perspectives. 
In Washington, we tend to see a direct relationship between economic pressure and eventual moderation of the target leadership. Many of our allies have exactly the opposite perspective. They fear that once isolated from the international community, Tehran will be further radicalized and may retaliate either via direct action against governments that have supported sanctions or by accelerating their nuclear efforts or withdrawing from the NPT. The irony is that neither the American nor the European perspective on sanctions is actually borne out by Iranian history. Iran's response to the repeated use of sanctions by Washington has neither involved capitulation to demands or radicalization. Instead, the regime typically se seeks refuge in denial while expending a great deal of effort on trying to mitigate the impacts of sanctions through smuggling, through promotion of substitute industries, and through economic diplomacy. Specifically with respect to IRPSA, Iran has been preparing for a possible embargo on imports of gasoline and other refined petroleum products through a variety of official schemes to minimize gasoline consumption and to establish strategic stockpiles of gasoline. More broadly, Iran's post-revolutionary experience contradicts the underlying ar American argument in support of sanctions. The Islamic Republic has experienced a number of, of episodes of severe economic pressure, but none have generated the kind of foreign policy moderation that the sponsors of IRPSA or the other manifold punitive measures against Tehran tend to forecast. Instead, in the past, when Iran has been under economic pressure, this has facilitated the coalescence of the regime and the consolidation of public support. Economic constraints have enhanced cooperation among Iran's factions. Tight purse strings have, in fact, forced some moderation of its economic policies, but not of its foreign policy. And I think that that's particularly important to remember today as we move forward with new pressure. Obviously, sanctions have to be a component of our overall integrated diplomatic strategy toward Iran, and one that has both a short-term and a long-term perspective. It is one of the few tools that remains at our disposal, and therefore I'd set forward the following five principles that should be uppermost in our minds in assessing new sanctions. The objectives need to be clear, limited, and achievable particularly sanctions that have a potential for influencing important constituencies that have some say in Iran's nuclear policies, measures that target the economic interests of the Revolutionary Guard Corps and other critical elements of Iran's hardline power structure. This is a particular uncertainty, I think, with respect to IRPSA. I'm not sure what the scenario that the sponsors of IRPSA have in mind is that the Iranian public, under great economic constraint, begins to go to the streets and voice its anger and frustration with its regime, and the regime somehow capitulates or moderates its policy toward the international community. It's really a scenario that doesn't bear any resemblance to the likely behavior of the Iranian leadership. It's also suggests that we need to be careful about our rhetoric when we talk about crippling sanctions that will break the back of the regime. Again, we need to be clear about the intended objective of our sanctions. We are not trying to bring down the regime that is not within the capacity of the, of the United States of America. What we are trying to do is reverse their position on the nuclear issue, and that means persuading them that their security is better served through another approach to the world. Secondly, we need to integrate sanctions within the continuum of U.S. diplomacy. I'm glad the Obama administration has dropped the sort of talk about carrots and sticks, but still the rhetoric of dual track seems to suggest that sanctions are an alternative to diplomacy. That's not in fact the case. Sanctions need to be a, a, a part of an integrated approach that actually uses sanctions to persuade Iran to come to the no negotiating table, because that's simply the only way we're going to get the Iranians to uh, uh, understand that their security security interests are better served by cooperation rather than confrontation. Third, we need to have that kind of broad international consensus and implementation that has been lacking for most of the past 30 years. Getting and keeping our allies on board with a sustained sanctions approach is important because so long as there are outliers, so long as there are hesitators like Russia and China historically, that makes it easier for others to sit on the fence and to avoid full Im implementation of the sanctions. With this respect, reset of the U.S.-Russian relationships has been a necessary uh, condition to improving the, the prospects for sanctions, but it's not going to be sufficient. To generate sufficient international support for sustaining meaningful economic pressure, we're going to have to make a credible case to our allies that our measures can actually impact in a positive fashion the nuclear calculus. Fourth, we need to focus on those measures that have uh, the best prospects for direct and immediate costs. This is, of course, the secret of the recent Treasury measures to restrict Iran's access to the financial system. They have actually hurt existing business, business that tends to be pursued by regime elites that have some influence over its behavior. 
any sorts of sanctions that hit at prospective projects, at, at, at pipeline projects that are many years from being away from being implemented, are likely not to have much impact on Iran's behavior, largely because its regime retains a certain degree of denial about its economic prospects. Finally, we have to speak, think very carefully about the prospects of any sanctions to influence Iran's uh, in, uh, emerging opposition movement. There have been varying calls within that opposition. Certainly the political leadership of the opposition has suggested uh, that sanctions would not help its position. There are others who have suggested, in fact, that new economic pressure might galvanize Iranians against the regime. I think both of these arguments have a certain degree of validity, but we have to recognize that measures that, that target the burgeoning economic role of the regime's repressive capacity that are specifically identified with its human rights abuses can serve a double purpose in pressing the regime, both in moderating its nuclear course and in its improving its treatment of its people at home. And here we should be support leveraging the interest in Europe. But we have to be careful to assume that somehow Iranians, if the price of gasoline goes up, if they can't achieve, uh, access home eating oil in the middle of a cold winter, are likely to vent their anger against their regime rather than at the Islamic Republic. The regime is quite uh, skilled at deflecting the impact of sanctions. And clearly, its rationing programs and its access to smuggling networks will permit the regime to insulate its core constituencies from the impact of reduced supplies. The notions that Iranians would welcome American efforts to cut off supplies of heating oil and gasoline, to me, sounds like the same kind of logic that suggested that Iraqis would greet us as liberators after we violently removed their regime. The reality is that the Iranian domestic climate is complicated and uncertainty. There are no simple solutions. And frankly, the cost of failure when it comes to applying sanctions is, not, is, is real and significant. If we move forward with a sanctions approach that does not work, the alternatives, specifically military options, are far worse in terms of advancing U.S. diplomatic interests in the region. And for that reason, we need to use sanctions, but use them within a larger diplomatic framework. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm honored and grateful to have the opportunity to share with the committee this morning some of the findings that I think have emerged from over a decade of research that my colleagues and I have done, uh, submitted in much more detail and written testimony about the probability of success of sanctions under these conditions. I think the Congress and the committee face a, a kind of bitter irony. The sanctions you have before you will no doubt if implemented, take a big economic bite out of Iran. The dilemma, of course, is they will not produce the political gain in concessions that are important for the interests of the United States. In fact, I would suggest that there are four or five basic principles we've learned from the history of implementation of sanctions that lead us to be quite cautious about the legislation that lies before us. First and foremost, generally, sanctions only have about a one-third track record. If you're a baseball player, this is a good batting average. If you're making economic policy or political policy at the foreign policy level, you'd like a great deal higher percentage. The smart sanctions that we've developed over the last decade, with that kind of success rate, we've been able to use astutely under certain kinds of conditions, particularly Libya being one of the best examples. On the other hand, trade sanctions, of which a major component this package is, really have a worse ratio over time. And I see nothing in the sponsored legislation that increases the possible success rates as applied to Iran under these conditions. Secondly, if sanctions are to be imposed for the kind of multiple violations that we know Iran is engaged in, whether it's uranium enrichment, human rights issues, or support for terrorist groups, those have been most successful under conditions of multilateral imposition, particularly with regard to the UN framework. So Congressman Flake's observations before, I think, are important to note. We have a group of partners who have been very successful, committed to what we'll do in terms of nuclear regulation over the last three years in 06, 07, and 08, strong regulations and resolutions out of the Security Council. I'm not necessarily sure we should jeopardize that by unilateral action that's likely to have less and less success. Thirdly, pure and simple, we cannot punish the Iranians into a nuclear deal. No state, even the United States, has ever been able to do that before. I don't see the conditions of success here. Only an astute mix of continued engagement, narrowly conceived sanctions applied at the appropriate time, and versatile incentives will prompt the Iranians, hopefully, to change their nuclear posture. This is not the time for adding sanctions to the mix of that engagement diplomacy. 
If imposed now, as Suzanne has mentioned, Iran will react with particularly negative consequences for the prospects of future engagement with the IAEA or with the five critical partners in which they are engaged. The ultimate leverage we have over time is the continued coalition of support that we built at the United Nations with the P5 states and with states in Europe who believe that continued diplomatic engagement, at least for a while, is the way to proceed. Fourth, in nations with the kind of internal disarray that we see currently in Iran, we have seen that rally round the flag effect that creates very, very difficult conditions. In fact, at its worst, would play into the Ahmadinejad government's insecurity and passion for repression of its own political groups. Why we would cast to them this kind of après vous is strange to me. We need to build and sustain coalitions in Iran that will see the United States as its friend and listen very adeptly to the kinds of reactions we have gotten from Iranians about the sanctions. Remember, we were able to sustain and have successful sanctions in South Africa over time because the opposition groups were saying that this was the appropriate strategy. And I think that is important for imposing sanctions. Now, with a sanctions expert being so negative on the possibility of imposing sanctions through this legislation, what do I offer you? I think there are some ways forward in which the United States can continue the engagement with the Iranians, but state very clearly a number of particular postulates. The first is that the American people and the Iranian people can be brought together around the notion that no nation in the future should or could seek its security through nuclear weapons. We should state to the Iranians that they should see the relationship we are building with Russia and the treaty we are about to submit to the Senate sometime in the next year, which leads to massive reductions on our use, in our nuclear arsenals. And we are trying to lead the way through a particular kind of leadership by example. And we encourage states that are thinking about the nuclear threshold to pay attention to this. Aggressive diplomacy of the first order in which we invite, embarrass, cajole, and incentivize the Iranians to think about the Geneva deal that they have left on the table as being at least a model for the way forward is the way to astutely use our leadership rather than sanctions in the future. It seems to me that we can go to the Security Council in the near term with a package of tightly conceived, smart and targeted sanctions which look at the entities and individuals that have violated prior Security Council resolutions and call upon our P5 partners and the rest of the Security Council to add another resolution to the strong mix of the three we have and continue the multilateral framework that will penalize the Iranians for IAEA uh, dismissal of regulations and an unwillingness to come forth uh, transparently with the progress of their program. Are there incentives we can offer the Iranians? Yes, I think we should move forward with a picture of what life may be like in a post-sanctions environment for them. The first and most important might be a recharacterization of the existing sanctions from 06 on, which would guarantee a right of the Iranians to enrich uranium up to a particular level and reaffirm their independence as a particularly strong state dependent on nuclear energy and medical technologies derived from nuclear technologies, but not so in an environment that is not fully transparent and open to international inspection. We should hold open to them the prospect for membership in trade and other organizations which current sanctions now prohibit. The best incentive one can offer, offer a, a sanctioned country is the removal of those sanctions, but we haven't specified exactly how that will look in a step-by-step -step reciprocation of Iranian actions. I have contributed more in my testimony, but my time has come to an end. I do believe that the administration's approach to engagement has to be understood as one year in a 30-year framework with the Iranians in which the turnaround and correspondence we seek from them may not have yet gone far enough down the road. And we have the strength, versatility, and energy as a diplomatic community to continue to put that pressure in a positive way and hold sanctions as uh, keeping the powder dry for at least another six to nine months in case the dilemma continues to manifest that we will need them. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Ms. Wright, I understand that you are going to give us a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and I, I understand that it is a good PowerPoint presentation. I had some reservations. I was. Uh, sharing with my staff and other, we went to uh, Afghanistan, and uh, you know how the military just loves to do PowerPoint presentations. So I asked General McKinnon to not do that; that we wanted a dialogue on that. And he answered back that what if he just had one slide? So we relented, and we thought that was a good compromise. Only to find out that he had put everything that he possibly could put for 50 slides on the one slide. And so we had our show anyway. But please proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mine is all pictures. Um, 
We'll all be able to understand. That's good. That's right. Um, the uprising launched after a disputed presidential election in June has evolved into the most vibrant and imaginative civil disobedience campaign in the 57 nations of the Islamic world, and maybe the world generally. For all the physical force used against the Green Movement, it has so far remained nonviolent in response. The Green Movement is a very broad coalition that includes former presidents and clerics, as well as people who've never voted at all, and millions of students in one of the youngest populations in the world, and women in one of the most politically active female populations in the Islamic world, both young and old. But these diverse sectors of society also see the core issues through very different prisms. The New Green Movement has managed to mobilize Iranians for public protests every few weeks since the election six months ago. It exploits anniversaries, commemorations, and holidays when the public is normally urged to demonstrate for government causes. They communicate in messages like this one on the internet, Facebook, and Twitter, or even in graffiti spray painted on public walls to turn government events into protests against the regime. The public demonstrations are when we hear their messages. At the November 4th commemoration of the U.S. Embassy takeover, Iranians normally are urged to shout death to America and death to Israel. This time, many shouted death to no one. More pointedly, others shouted, Obama, you are either with us or with them. This is a message now heard often. The demonstration last week on National Students' Day was the largest since the summer. It erupted on several campuses, and additional protests are expected later this month to mark the religious holiday of Ashura, and again during the first two months of next year on various anniversaries of the revolution, the same period when the United States and its allies will be debating new international sanctions. In policy debates on Iran, there's a lot of talk about clocks. Iran's clock on its suspected nuclear program, the slow clock of diplomacy and UN sanctions, and Israel's impatient clock. To that should be added a new one, the opposition clock. What the opposition does is more important than us body will ever consider. After six months, the, the, uh, movement, the Green Movement has proven that it has reached critical mass and has proven its durability. Since June, the Green Movement has shifted its agenda from disputes over the election of President Ahmadinejad to the role and powers of Iran's supreme leader and the very definition of an Islamic state. Death to the dictator is now a common chant with uh, mounting anger over the militarization of the regime and the growing role of the Revolutionary Guards. This cartoon recently made the rounds calling for the supreme leader to be booted from have very different goals. Dozens of factions under the green banner can be sorted into at least three general categories. Each represents a different side of a sometimes unlikely alliance. The first layer is the public campaign of civil disobedience, which extends well beyond the demonstrations. Iran's currency has become a medium for the message. Some st stamp pictures and slogans on the rial, this one of Ahmadinejad, along with the slogan, People's Enemy. Most lash out angrily at the regime. Others reproduce pictures like this one with the famous uh, picture of the female student Ned Neda Sultan, who was shot at a street protest in June. This picture is from the cell phone video that captured her dying. The graffiti is usually in green. Some slogans merely appeal to others who might get that note to write slogans on other banknotes. The banknotes even carry protests against the, re against the regime's foreign policy. This one against Iran's ties with uh, Venezuela's Chavez, and here against Russia. The regime reportedly tried to take the graffiti money out of circulation, but found there was too much to destroy. Another civil disobedience campaign calls on the opposition to boycott all goods from food to cell phones advertised on state-controlled television. Civil disobedience includes individual uncoordinated acts. Mahmoud Vahidnia is a math student who was invited to a meeting between Iran's supreme leader and the academic elite. He went to the microphone and instead of asking a question, warned the supreme leader in a 20-minute tirade that he lived in a bubble and didn't understand what was happening in Iran. Iranian television, which was broadcasting the program live, turned it off but not before it was taped by the BBC and others and is now a very popular item on YouTube. The growing signs of dissent show in many ways, on public buses, 
and on building walls. Public space is used to give notice about protests, when the regime closes down cell phones or slows the Internet. Posters are often, appeared over, often appear overnight, issuing new demands. Many call for the release of political prisoners, who are now part of show trials reminiscent of the Soviet show trials of the 1930s and the Chinese uh, uh, Cultural Revolution of the 1960s. The slogans are often in Farsi and English because they want to get their message to the outside world. Even sports teams have come, become involved. Iran's national team wore green during a match abroad in June. Inside the country, some opposition have dared to attend games wearing green, which has reportedly led the government to broadcast the games in black and white. The, art movement, the green movement has generated some lively new art. This is the famous cell phone video of Neda Sultan, the young woman again shot in June. That gruesome photo has become a popular poster in the technique used for the Obama campaign. The same image has been blended into the artwork of the Iranian flag, so her play, face takes the place of the religious symbol in the middle. The blood pattern has also been imposed on the supreme leader's face, an implicit message that he is responsible for her death. The reaction by the first category or layer is the most important sector when it comes to sanctions. Two key points. Many in the opposition support sanctions against the Revolutionary Guards or specific members of the regime, but adamantly oppose sanctions that will hurt the people at a time of serious economic problems and a time when many in the opposition already face losing their jobs, students facing losing their places in universities and, as a result, their future. Second, Persian nationalism is among the strongest forces in the world. If you know a Texan, add 5,000 years, and you've got Persian nationalism. The revolution was in trouble in the 1980s when Saddam Hussein invaded, but millions of people who didn't like, trust, or support the revolution rallied to the regime in the name of Persian nationalism. Public sentiment on sanctions is complicated by the nuclear issue, and again, Persian nationalism plays a role. Reliable polls indicate that Iranians almost universally support nuclear energy as the key to modern development. Shirin Abadi, the Iranian Nobel laureate, a human rights lawyer, said of the program, aside from being economically justified, it has become a cause of national pride for an old nation with a glorious history. No Iranian government, regardless of its ideology or democratic credentials, would dare to stop the program. The second layer is the traditional political elite, which has struggled to develop a viable strategy. There are, as yet, no Mandela's, Havel's, or Valences in Iran. The opposition has been a body looking for a head since the beginning. The reform movement latched on to former President Khatami in 1997 because he talked about opening up the system, but they also abandoned him when he failed to do so. This time, the opposition rallied around Mousavi, not because they liked him the best, but because they thought he was the only one who could stand up to the supreme leader, as he had in the 1980s when they were in different jobs. But Mousavi is an accidental leader. He occasionally issues statements and visits families of political detainees, but he has failed to create a plan of action or even to appear much in public. Mehdi Karoubi, the former Speaker of Parliament and another presidential campaign in June, is more of a maverick. He first publicized claims of rape and torture of dissidents in jail and has tried often to join the protests. The traditional political elites in the opposition would also like to see the regime punished under sanctions, but again, no sanctions that might further hurt the people and undermine the opposition. Mousavi has complicated the situation for both the regime and the outside world by rejecting the recent Tehran reactor deal. It's widely believed that this is merely internal politics, objecting to any initiative that might strengthen Ahmadinejad's claim to legitimacy. Iran's nuclear program has basically become a political football at home, with its own internal dynamics that could deeply complicate diplomacy. The third layer, very briefly, is the debate among the clerics, which is least visible but quite intriguing and very important to understand. Ayatollah Montazari is the most outspoken and credible opposition cleric, 
but there are many, many, many others. Montazaria was originally selected as Ayatollah Khomeini's heir, but was stripped of the title when he began to criticize the regime for its injustices. Since June, he has been scathing about the government, at one point warning Iran's security forces not to take actions that they would someday have to justify before God. Montazari issued a fatwa in October against nuclear weapons on grounds that they are against God's will and will inevitably kill civilians as well as the military. He urged Muslims worldwide to take the lead in campaigning against nuclear arms. Among themselves, the clerics are now intensely debating what constitutes good governance, what an Islamic state should do and be, and even whether an Islamic state is good long-term for Islam. The clergy I've spoken with over the years, and I've been going to Iran almost every year since 1973, actually care about the nuclear energy issue. But like the public, they feel the regime has pushed the nuclear issue too far, at great cost to the nation's standing, its future potential, with millions of Iranians paying the price. As a result of the debate, Iran's supreme leader is increasingly standing alone among his own. Many clerics have long been wary of theocratic rule for fear the human shortcomings of a modern Islamic state would taint Islam. As they hear vast numbers of protesters challenging Khamenei or see their messages on Iran's national currency, the, the debate among them has intensified. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, quite good. I appreciate that. Ambassador Dobbins. Well, that's going to be hard to top. Um, <laughs> I'm afraid after that multimedia excursion, we're back to boring Washington wonk talk. Um, I think all the witnesses, including myself, agree that further international sanctions will probably not compel a change in Iran's uh, nuclear policies. Um, nevertheless, I think there are good reasons to pursue additional sanctions. There are, in fact, at least five distinct rationales for further sanctions. The obvious one is to influence Iranian policy. A second would be to promote positive change in the nature of the Iranian regime. A third objective is to degrade Iranian military and power projection capabilities. A fourth is to set a deterrent example for other aspirant proliferators. And finally, whatever may be the uh, hoped for effect of sanctions, such measures provide an irresistible alternative uh, to the other two options, which are even less desirable, the options of either doing nothing to uh, respond to Iranian nuclear program or going to war to prevent it. Um, historically, sanctions have seldom, seldom forced uh, improved behavior on the part of targeted regimes. Sanctions did not compel the Soviet Union to withdraw from Afghanistan, Pakistan to halt its nuclear weapons program, Saddam to evacuate Kuwait, the Haitian military regime to step aside, Milosevic to halt ethnic cleansing in Bosnia and Kosovo, or the Taliban to expel Osama bin Laden. Stiff sanctions were applied in all of these cases, but it took either a foreign military intervention or violent domestic resistance or both to bring about the desired changes. Now, while none of the above named regimes altered their behavior in response to sanctions, all but one of them eventually fell. And sanctions may have contributed to their fall, but more as a gesture of solidarity with those seeking to change the regime, often by violent means, than as the prime cause. Universally supported sanctions in support of human rights in Iran might make a similar contribution, as they did uh, in South Africa, in Haiti, in Serbia, in Iraq, and in, Af and in Afghanistan. However, at the current moment, there's not much prospect of getting a universal, universally supported sanctions against Iran uh, uh, based on uh, democratization as an objective. Um, the objective for additional sanctions in Iran is rather uh, under consideration uh, in order to try to force Iran to abandon its nuclear aspirations. Sanctions so directed are unlikely to encourage and could even diminish uh, domestic resistance to the regime. Most Iranians, as has been noted, um, including the democratic supporters, support Iran's efforts to master the nuclear fuel cycle, and sanctions that are applied for this purpose um, could well uh, r increase support for the regime rather than the reverse. Now, sanctions can definitely degrade the economic performance of the targeted state and thereby limit its military and power projection potential. That was certainly true in Saddam's Iraq. Uh, it was also true with respect to Haiti, Serbia, and Afghanistan. 
In each case, comprehensive and universally uh, enforced sanctions made an, made an eventual American military intervention even easier than it otherwise be, would be. So sanctions as a prelude to invasion and occupation have a lot to recommend them. Even unilateral American sanctions, for instance, against Cuba and Iran, have had some impact on the targeted country's economy and capacity to project power. Unfortunately, these, human, these unilaterally applied sanctions also have tended to bolster the targeted regimes and increase their domestic political support. Thus, paradoxically, unilateral American sanctions have both moderated and perpetuated the threat that such, presume, such regimes present. The exemplary deterrent effect of sanctions is hard to measure, but is probably the best reason for going ahead with further sanctions against Iran. If the international community failed to respond to the Iranian program, it would be giving a green light to a number of other countries, including a number of countries in the region, to go down the same path. So that's certainly a reason to continue to uh, sanction uh, Iran. Uh, finally, uh, we have the political imperative to not just stand there but do something. In situations where inaction is unacceptable and, pre and preemptive military attack unappealing, sanctions may provide the only alternative. Uh, and this is certainly uh, one of the reasons that, uh, that, that many outside the, uh, outside the government and many of you will end up supporting uh, sanctions. Um, while sanctions may offer an irresistible uh, political fix to a policy dilemma, they're not cost free. Virtually every country that's ever been sanctioned eventually had a revolution, changed the regime, and became an American aid recipient. And American aid to countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, the Balkans, and Haiti has in large measure uh, been directed to undoing the effect of sanctions. And so in effect, the American taxpayer does end up paying a certain proportion and a not negligible proportion of the cost of sanctions as they're applied over time. One can only imagine how much money the United States is going to provide a democratic Cuba to, un to, to uh, reverse the effect of 50 years of embargo. To recapitulate, further sanctions against Iran are not likely to alter its nuclear policies. They will, uh, they will weaken the state economically and even militarily. Um, sanctions against Iran will serve to some degree at least as a deterrent to other proliferators. Um, uh, further sanctions are almost inevitable for the reasons I've suggested. The next question, therefore, is what kind of sanctions make sense? Um, we've heard uh, from Robin and from others about the nature of the internal dynamic. There's basically a competition between the revolutionary, between the Islamic tendency in the regime personified by the Ayatollahs, the Republican nature of the regime, personified by elected politicians, uh, and the revolutionary nature of the regime, personified by the Revolutionary Guard. And for 30 years, these have been in some equilibrium. That equilibrium has been broken as a result of the uh, fraudulent election and the popular reaction to it, and you're now moving increasingly toward a police state. But that's not necessarily an inherent, uh, uh, a, a, a stable condition, and it could go in a number of different directions, including toward more democratization, toward a greater police state, or back toward some equilibrium. It seems likely that sanctions that targeted Iranian society as a whole would promote the least desirable of these results. That is to say, the consolidation of a police state under the Revolutionary Guard. Such would be particularly the case if the sanctions were to restrict the flow of consumer products, of which gasoline is probably the commodity most widely consumed. Such a ban would hit hardest those who own automobiles, that is to say the urban middle class, precisely those whom, whose pictures we've seen protesting against uh, the regime and risking their lives to do so. So, interna so an internationally opposed ban on the sale of gasoline would probably penalize the population, particularly the most politically progressive element of the population, and strengthen the most regressive elements in the regime. A unilateral American ban would be meaningless, as the United States does not export any gasoline to Iran. A unilateral American ban with extraterritorial application would seem to offer the worst combination of effects, penalizing the population, strengthening the regime, embroiling the United States in endless disputes with its allies, and disrupting the current international solidarity in opposition to Iran's nuclear aspirations. So what to do? 
Strength and sanctions are needed to reduce Iran's capacity to threaten its neighbors, to deter other aspiring nations, aspiring nuclear powers, and to provide an alternative to even less productive courses of action. To achieve these results while minimizing negative consequences, such sanctions should be international. They should be targeted on the regime and on its nuclear potential. Such measures would include a comprehensive embargo on arms sales and on transfer of nuclear technology, financial sanctions focused on the military, on power projection capabilities, and on the internal, on the internal security apparatus, and an international travel ban on those associated with all of these institutions. Sanctions which single out the leadership and impose even symbolic penalties on them can further delegitimize that leadership in the, idea, on the eyes of the Iranian people. Sanctions designed to impoverish the country as a whole probably would have a reverse effect. Finally, any sanctions need to be rapid, rapidly reversible. Admittedly, there seems little immediate prospect that the Iranian regime will alter its behavior in the near term. Nevertheless, on two occasions over the last eight years, the Islamic Republic has made far-reaching overtures of cooperation and accommodation with Washington. Those offers were made in the immediate aftermath of the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan, and then a year later, its invasion of Iraq. In the mood of national hubris, which prevailed in this country back then, Washington chose to ignore both overtures. We cannot predict if and when another such opportunity will arise, but we should ensure that the president, that our president, is in a position to respond rapidly if and when it does. This argues for including in any legislation broad authority for the president to waive or terminate sanctions in response to changing conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank all of you. I think your testimony was very, very helpful and enlightening as well. Let me start the questioning uh, aspect of this. I heard, uh, Dr. Maloney, and I see in your written testimony a statement saying that the Supreme National Security Committee, which is one of the key institutions of the state, is responsible for nuclear negotiations and overall foreign policy coordination, but it appears to be functioning in crisis mode because of the bitter differences among the principals. So, Ambassador, you've had as much direct contact with Iranians uh, as anyone here, so let me ask you, is it at all the case of their failure to respond to the diplomatic overtures so far is because there's various conflicting uh, groups that you all testify to are, are just frozen right now uh, politically inside and they're unable to uh, agree on a way forward to even react to international overtures? I, I think that's likely the case. Um, the regime clearly is both weakened and distracted by the reaction to the election. I was actually quite surprised that they were able to engage as quickly as they did and initially to agree to the proposals uh, that the um, that the, uh, that the international community had put to them, um, uh, but that rapidly degenerated into a national debate in which the reformers, among others, uh, began to criticize the regime for the possible accommodation um, with the international community. And I think that does mean that, that as long as this degree of uncertainty, turmoil, weakness, and distraction continue, it's going to be very difficult to regime. the other will drive them away. They'll either blame them for exacerbating an already bad situation or they'll feel that the world community is sort of ganging up on them and making their life worse and they, uh, they better get together and rally around the nationalistic flag. Uh, do all of you come down on one side or the other of that uh, argument thinking that it's going to be a bad idea? Uh, I know, Ambassador, you just testified to that effect and I think I heard that in the flavor of the others, uh, that imposing uh, refined... Thank you. Uh, refined petroleum sanctions and things of that nature would probably have the adverse effect of driving the general populace in Iran uh, toward uh, the current regime and maybe buttressing them. Dr. Maloney, I'll start with you. The population responds. Um, certainly, Iranians can walk and chew gum at the same time. They can detest their regime and also resent the international community for making their life more difficult. And frankly, that's always been the historical reaction to the American sanctions regime among Iranians when you walk the streets. They want to know why they're being punished for the misdeeds of their of their own government. I think the current conditions are, are, are chaotic and 
fl fluid enough that it's possible that Iranians uh, may turn more toward the green movement in, in, in the aftermath of increased economic pressure. But it will not, in fact, persuade the regime to be more accommodating internationally. They will see themselves under greater threat and they will certainly be more difficult to deal with, just as, as Ambassador Dobbins has suggested, the current situation is making it difficult for them to come to the table in a serious way and negotiate over a sustained period of time with a clear and coherent position. If the internal temperature becomes that much more uh, inflamed, then I think it will be that much more difficult to uh, have a serious set of nuclear negotiations in the near future. And as Robin has suggested, there, there is a time urgency to the nuclear dilemma. Dr. Lopez, you agree with that? Yeah, I, yes, I do. I'd go one step further, is, is that the imposition of sanctions permits the regime to shift attention to a new level of competition, if not conflict, with the United States and takes the eyes off what, what ought to be the main focus, and that is what's wrong with the Geneva Accord that we seemed in early October to have a reasonable degree of consensus with the Iranians on, that we want to keep our focus on that as a template around which we negotiate. And there may be ways in which uh, the threat of sanctions over the next three to six months gives us much more leverage with the Iranian leadership than the imposition, because it doesn't permit the leadership to focus on new actions by the United States taken under conditions of new hostility. It keeps our eye on the central focus of what's wrong with this existing nuclear deal that on paper looked fairly good to all concerned in early October. Thank you. You know, we, um, the statement I took out of Ambassador Dobbins' statement on this was the, uh, the political imperative to not just stand there but do something. Uh, and I think you mentioned your testimony seems to be driving a lot of members as well as anybody else. And it's a strong and powerful situation when you feel that somebody is, um, is not responding. Can we effectively target sanctions, say, on the Revolutionary Guard or on some of the elites there um, in such a way that it, that it doesn't? Uh, adversely affect the general population? Is, are there things left to be done that do not already exist in the current sanctions uh, regime that we have? You've got the same problem I have with the microphone. We have to turn it on. Ambassador, we have to turn the microphone on. Sorry. Uh, I, I think that things like international travel bans, um, financial sanctions directed at individuals, um, named individuals, uh, targeting companies that are owned by the Revolutionary Guard, um, uh, and, and frankly, just labeling those individuals and those organizations as pariahs, and this has to be international to be effective, and international sanctions that have, do that will further delegitimize the regime, encourage domestic opposition, and make the regime feel uncomfortable, and they won't like it. And, it, it, and that in itself can provide a certain degree of satisfaction, even if it doesn't produce the desired results. Thank you. Mr. Flake, you recognize five minutes. I thank the chairman and thank all the witnesses. This is one of the most informative hearings I've been a part of uh, for, for a long time, and uh, I thank the chairman for arranging it. Uh, Dr. Maloney, you mentioned that uh, the Iranian regime is already preparing uh, to deal with uh, IRPSA, for example. What uh, examples can you give? How are they preparing? In uh, the summer of 2007, they instituted a nationwide gasoline rationing program that, despite uh, some early f tremors of uh, unrest, was largely accepted by the population. It's been abused, it's been exploited, but in fact there is now a, a, a very systematized rationing program as well as a black market price for gasoline which did not exist prior to that period. They have, in addition, uh, put major investments into transferring most of the public vehicle fleet from away from gasoline toward compressed nat natural gas, which of course they have uh, vast quantities of, and so they've sought uh, additional uh, additional sort of conservation measures. And they have, at least reportedly, been trying to stockpile gasoline as well as activate some of the smuggling networks and craft deals with allies, including Venezuela and possibly also China. There are conflicting reports, reports on this to expand their gasoline imports from those countries. Finally, they've also been investing in a major program of expanding and upgrading their own refinery capacity so that they will not be as vulnerable in the future to this. Dr. Lopez, you, thank you. Dr. Lopez, you've studied this a lot, and uh, uh, we hear from the proponents of uh, sanctions, particularly the petroleum sanctions, that uh, other countries and companies that are dealing with Iran will simply have to make the choice. Do they uh, 
uh, want to exclude themselves from the U.S. market or the Iranian market, and they'll choose uh, to go with the, the U.S. Is that necessarily the case? Is it that simple? No, I don't think it's that simple. I, I, I think what has to come along with that assertion is what then is going to be the cost and the logistics of implementing and enforcing that? Imagine a world in which U.S. tankers in the Persian Gulf are confronting Venezuelan ships who see themselves in solidarity with the Iranian people trying to deliver gas, refined petroleum. Which crisis do you want to manage? I think we'd want to manage a crisis with our uh, Russian, Chinese, and other allies at the Security Council of a defiant Iranian regime that wants to throw out the IAEA because we're on the stronger ground there rather than shifting the terms of enforcement of, of an oil embargo, uh, which has many, many routes for undercutting it. We've never had any success with secondary sanctions. That is, with those who've tried to participate in a sanctions regime by, uh, by, by sometimes uh, honoring it diplomatically but undercutting it economically. That takes us, in a sense, in a side road that's only going to be a, a very, very long and difficult road for the United States to undo. It really becomes a sideshow that's not at all in our interest. All right. Thank you. Ms. Wright, um, you mentioned uh, that some of the protesters were shouting, um, uh, Mr. Obama, you're for us or against us. What do they mean by that? If, uh, if you say that uh, they're not in favor of uh, what's on the table right now in terms of what the U.S. is proposing or sanctions that will target or uh, impact the population in general, what do they want the president to do that he's not doing? Is it simply rhetorically getting behind them or what? I think there's a particular focus or desire for the United States to take a much stronger role or a stronger position on human rights. They're not looking for the White House to come out and support the Green Movement. In fact, that would end up tainting them right. and give the regime a chance, uh, grounds on which to prosecute more of them uh, for being spies for the United States or agents of the United States. Uh, but they do want to, to, to have a sense that the world, the United States, as the most powerful spokesman for the free world, is uh, willing to take a stand on behalf of them. The president's reference in his Nobel, um, when he was, uh, is the, the announcement was made about his Nobel Peace Prize, and he referred just a little bit to Neda Sultan, not by name, but a situation uh, reflected, he mentioned the situation when she died, and that resonated in Iran in enormous ways. It doesn't take very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, in my remaining time, all of us up here have one of these, and we're going to be asked to go to the floor later today and use it. It's a voting card uh, with regard to IRPSA. If you had one of these and you were going to vote this afternoon, how would you do? How would you vote? I, I realize there are arguments can be made this way, but we only have this card and we only have this vote today. And if we could start with Dr. Maloney, um, how would you vote? I'd vote against the Okay. I'd vote against these sanctions. I think there are a lot of problems with these sanctions, and they could backfire. Uh, I would vote against them unless I got the kind of assurances that the chairman was talking about. Thank you. And then the, uh, the assurances, I don't know if you know what they were or not, or anything like that, are that uh, these have either not be implemented uh, until the White House and the President, uh, during their dipl diplomatic initiatives, thought that it was now essential to move to that point, or that the uh, given the flexibility to use them but not be mandated to use them and wave back. But those assurances are not with the legislation right now. Are those assurances. Those are not, not in the legislation. The assurances that I'm going to receive are that they will be in any final bill that we vote on after conference. Uh, on that, uh, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our witnesses. I, I think the uh, testimony here has been. Uh, very, very helpful in us making our decision. My only regret is that uh, the other 430-something uh, uh, members of, of the House are not here to, to hear your testimony as well. And I, I, I want to associate myself both with the, uh, the, the remarks of, of our chairman and, and his conditions, as well as the concerns raised by the ranking member. Uh, and I, I think it's... Uh, you know, this could be a case where, where there is significant and courageous opposition right now in Iran, uh, as, as Ms. Wright has uh, so articulately presented. Uh, 
this could be a case of us uh, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, just when uh, there may be a, an opportunity here for an internal uh, change and transition within Iran, uh, we may be doing something that, uh, that defeats all of that. And, and I have very little limited experience in this. Uh, you, you are the bona fide experts. But uh, I, I look at the situation in Cuba, uh, and, I, and I've, I've had an opportunity to review that firsthand. The, the support, the rallying around the flag effect, as Mr. Lopez has, uh, has, has described it, uh, it's, it's a real phenomenon. And I think that's what has kept Castro in power in Cuba, because he, he stood up uh, to, to America, and he also had a ready excuse, the embargo, uh, for anything that went wrong in Cuba. And he blames uh, you know, tropical storms. He'll blame that on the embargo, and, uh, and it gives him great cover. Uh, you know, I've been to Gaza a couple of times, and the embargo there in Gaza has caused great uh, rallying around Hamas, regardless of their incompetence and uh, inability to deliver for, for their people. And uh, I have a fear that we're going to, this is the best thing that could possibly happen to, to uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. I think that he is, uh, he is welcoming this. This will cause the Iranian population to, to rally around him. Uh, so I, I, I agree with basically everything that's been said here this morning. The, the one question I had was around the mechanics. And I don't know, Ambassador, you might be the best person uh, to, to answer this. Uh, to, to, really, to really limit, uh, to, to implement the Iran uh, Refined Petroleum Sanctions Act, it would seem to require a naval embargo of some sort and a land embargo to, to prevent refined petroleum from coming back into Iran, and, and I guess I'm asking, is this, a, is this a, a proxy vote for military action here? Because, I mean, I understand it's going to need, uh, it's going to need approval by the UN Security Council, but this is a, a first step in that direction. So uh, how, how would this work out in practice? Um, well, if, if, if such a measure were to secure, were to get Security Council approval, um, the Security Council could also authorize enforcement measures, as was the case with Iraq, for instance, when it was under even more, con Iraq was forbidden from exporting its uh, oil, for instance, which was an even more um, You're referring to the Iraq sanctions. for food program? No, well, I, no, I'm saying that Iraq, the Iraq for Food program came later as an effort to ameliorate the effect of the earlier right. sanction, which was simply to ban ec Iraq from exporting its oil. And there, and, and there were enforcement provisions that prevented Iraq from exporting its oil. We, we were allowed to overfly the country. We were allowed to bomb Iraq periodically. We could stop ships. And this was all authorized by UN Security Council. So theoretically, you could do that. First of all, you're not going to get a Security Council measure uh, in support of uh, an embargo on gasoline or uh, refined oil products. That's not going to happen. Uh, secondly, even if you did, you probably wouldn't be able to get authorization for those kinds of enforcement measures. But, uh, and so what we're talking about here is a, is a unilateral U.S. measure with some extraterritorial application. That is, we will penalize foreign companies for engaging in this behavior by denying them access to our market. Um, uh, I don't think that uh, either the Congress or the administration would intend to use military forces to enforce that. So I don't think there's a danger that this would precipitate uh, the administration to authorizing military action to enforce this. I think the enforcement mechanisms, if it was approved, um, would be legal mechanisms designed to penalize firms from, say, Great Britain or France or Germany. Uh, who sell uh, products to Iran from selling products in the United States, and we'd get into endless legal hassles and diplomatic disputes with those countries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Duncan, you're recognized. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling a very uh, interesting and informative uh, hearing. Uh, first of all, I want to associate myself with the opening remarks of my ranking member, Flake. I thought he made a good summary of uh, what I wish was our position and and um, also uh, agree with uh, Mr. Lynch that it's unfortunate that uh, all the members uh, couldn't have heard the uh, presentation that's been made here this morning because uh, I think all of us know that uh, 
uh, this afternoon we will pass, um, in the House at least, pass uh, this, this uh, sanction legislation by an overwhelming margin. And, and um, I think that's unfortunate because I think you've made, uh, the witnesses have made a pretty convincing case that um, these sanctions of this, uh, this legislation is not a good thing to do, particularly, at least at this, uh, at this time. I think that... Um, we need a, a, a more um, neutral um, foreign policy toward the uh, Middle East. Uh, I think we, ne we need to try very hard to be friends with Israel, but we also need to try harder and do more to be friends uh, with uh, other countries in the Middle East. I read uh, a year or so ago an interesting book called All the Shah's Men about uh, uh, Iran and, and uh, some of our activities there and in unfortunately many other countries um, uh, some of our um, uh, activities to intervene in in political or religious or ethnic disputes have uh, created almost more enemies than friends uh, for our country um, what, do you do you think um, um, basically that's all I really have to say I, if um, um, I don't know if, if you have any suggestions as to how, if, if or when we um, pass this uh, sanctions legislation, uh, how we could do that and still, and, or if there's something more we could do to uh, show the Iranian people that it's not really aimed at them, but just um, really towards uh, their top leadership and, and almost even t more towards one man at the top. If you have any, if you have any comments or anything, you anything you wish to add, feel free to comment. Well, I would suggest, Mr. Duncan, that it's very, very important to uh, get the extra rider in this bill uh, out of conference that that gives the White House some degree of flexibility on this. That the executive branch would would, would judge when implementation and under what conditions would occur, and I think we ought to be much further down the road before that implementation occurs. Well, I think that's a good suggestion. Ms. Wright? I was just going to add very briefly that uh, th there's always been a struggle on public relations on these initiatives, and we never have been able over 30 years to explain ourselves what our goals are to the Iranian people. Sometimes the White House or the State Department will come out with a statement simply saying this, our target is not the people of Iran, but that doesn't go very far. And the Iranians, of course, with their media monopoly, can spin this in a way all of not just this bill, but you know, any action taken by the United States as something designed to hurt all Iranians. And um, any effort to portray the alternative um, that this is designed to, in the end, help them um, could make a difference. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Mr. Quigley, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and as the relatively new person on the block. This is quite an education for me as well. Uh, and I appreciate the remarks that my colleagues have made about the reservations that the panel seems to have about the effectiveness of sanctions. Um, but I can't help read the obvious in the news recently, in the Times of London, about uh, the Iranian nuclear weapons system being farther along than we had anticipated and in recent news, much larger than we anticipated. Um, so I hear that either sanctions don't work, and not just from this panel, or they take a long time to work, or they must be specifically targeted with a lot of coalition assistance. Uh, they haven't worked yet, uh, t with the exceptions and the limitations that the ambassador has talked about, uh, and they probably won't work in this set of circumstances, but we don't have a lot of time. And with the greatest respect, I would suggest that it's not going to do the Iranian people who we want to be friends with a whole lot of good if they achieve a nuclear weapon or two, and they certainly have enough material. Um, and that makes them, more than anyone else, a target for reprisal and for the destabilization uh, of the entire region and threats not just to Israel, but to our other allies and our troops. So uh, I guess I'm saying Monty Hall isn't pointing to door number three. There's door number one or door number two. Uh, 
if we're in a short time frame, tell us the options then if you would vote against this. I'll, I'll take an opening crack at that. Um, I, I, I don't think there are any good options, and that's something that Secretary Gates has been saying uh, for many years now. It's something that most of us who work on Iran deal with every day. Be, there are no silver bullets to a regime that has been in power for 30 years, that has survived endless crises, and will probably uh, even see this one through, at least for the short to medium term. I would raise just one point about the time frame. The Iranian nuclear program is an urgent dilemma, but we are not yet at a stage where Iran has either the, a nuclear weapon or the capacity to deliver one. We are several years away from that period. And we need to give diplomacy some time to work. That means diplomacy using sanctions, using the combined weight of the international community, working in coordinated fashion for perhaps the very first time since the Iranian revolution to deal with this government. It means giving the Iranian democratic opposition some time to actually bring itself together, find a strategy, develop a leadership that can truly confront the regime. But I am quite confident that, in fact, we can, over a period of several years, deal in a much more coordinated, much more effective fashion with Iran. But that needs to involve both diplomacy and economic pressure, and in particular, very strong coordination with the international community. Well, wouldn't you acknowledge, Doctor, that the time frame that we thought we were working with has compressed already? And you're, you're, you're talking about taking a pretty big risk if we're assuming it's not going to contract again. I'm making no assumptions whatsoever because I think obviously we don't know everything that there is to know about the Iranian nuclear program and we were surprised in 2002 about the extent we have been surprised by the regime's willingness and determination to push forward despite the threat of international pressure and sanctions. But I think we also recognize that there have been technical problems with the program that in fact despite the massive investment that the regime has made, they have not yet achieved a weapons capability. There is fuel that has been uh, amassed, but there are ways that the international community can deal with that. And one of them, the very good, I think, proposal by the administration to export the LEU is one that can be continue to be pursued. There are at least some signs that there are some within the Iranian regime who would support a revised version of that deal. And I think that is one of the aims that sanctions ought to be directed toward, rather than simply punishing the country as a whole, rather than simply trying to reap the highest economic price against Iran, because we know from past history that won't succeed. May I, Mr. Chairman, uh, respond to this in, in that I think it, it really focuses on us on what's a medium-term goal. And the highest order medium-term goal, it seems to me, is to create an environment in which it becomes far too costly for the Iranians to continue to reject IAEA guidelines and IAEA inspections. Let's remember that the Naran's plant is still under IAEA guidelines. The primary uh, generator of enriched uranium is still under international inspection and control. One of the great advantages of the Iraqi sanctions over time was that we had a nice linkage between the pressure of sanctions and the maintenance of inspections. If you wanted the sanctions lifted, you had to be continually forthcoming with inspections. And I think to the extent to which this pressure uh, in the government to worry about a longer term time clock and sanctions is the answer, your limited targeted sanctions against key component uh, entities that supply high level components to the regime or elements of the Revolutionary Guard, identifiable people who are in charge of the nuclear program, to the extent to which they can be targeted, sends the appropriate message of urgency, but also doesn't risk the possibility of the Iranians expelling the IAEA or withdrawing from the MPT. So we want to keep this tense synergy between those. And there's a way in which the, the greatest dilemma that Congress faces is that all the available tools seem to be a, a toy store that we can, we can mobilize. But in fact, you have to be very astute and selective about how to do that, with the medium-term goal being continued dialogue and inspection of the IAEA. It may be that the end point, 2011, 12, or 13, puts us in a position in the same one we were in with Libya. I'd make the case that sanctions were very successful in turning around Libyan commitment to terrorism and to its weapons of mass destruction program. But we had to go past the 11th hour, and fortunately we didn't sacrifice constructive engagement, even when, when they went beyond the threshold that we hoped they would not.
They woke up one day and realized that a nuclearized state is not all it's cracked up to be. We may have to go through that entire threshold with the Iranians. I hope we are not, but I think only a strategy of constructive engagement and a step-by-step -step approach to medium goals will get us to where we want to be. With the unanimous consent to see it, sure, absolutely. Uh, if you're looking for impact, the kinds of sanctions that have had the biggest uh, impact on the regime are the banking sanctions imposed by the Treasury Department. Uh, this is something that has mobilized the international community because of laws passed after 9-11 that make every bank responsible for knowing the origin of the flow of money that they have in their banks. And as a result, the five largest banks in Iran have been in crippled from doing international business. That's the, you know, and expanding that avenue, that type of sanctions, even though it does have impact on the people, makes the regime sit up and notice. And it ends up paying a real price because it, it can find alternatives, but at a much higher price. Th uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and I just want to know, as you say, though, that sanction worked, and it did, as you suggest, hurt the Iranian people at the same time. I mean, it, it's, it's very complicated and difficult, but uh, you're telling us don't use the only tool we have right now to, to a certain, certain extent if you start limiting what sanctions we can use. You ask what works, and this is something that's had a very quickly has had an impact. I lived in Africa for seven years, the last seven years of sanctions against Rhodesia and, and sanctions during apartheid, and it you know takes a very long time for sanctions to work. The impact of banking sanctions has been almost unprecedented of any case around the world in terms of how quickly it's made a regime sit up and notice, how big a price, literally uh, and politically, it is exacted. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and I want to thank our witnesses as well for their being here and their testimony. Uh, in today's post, uh, Danielle Pletka, and I believe I'm pronouncing that name right, has a piece in there, pretty compelling piece, and um, the writer talks about this, uh, at least what uh, they believe uh, the administration has, take, has kind of resigned themselves to a nuclear-armed Iran and moving in a direction of a, quote, containment policy. Um, I would like to get your reactions to to the premise of, of the piece, and then also um, kind of moving into what Ms. Wright pointed out in her opening uh, statements, the implica if in fact that is the case, that this containment policy is what's being pursued, the implications that has uh, for our country to support the reform or democracy movement that's, uh, that's in Iran. And so we can just go down the list and you can, you can fire away. Or, or we can start with Dr. Moore. Uh, I would disagree that the administration at this stage has settled on containment. I think that that uh, really belies everything that has been done, particularly uh, the very creative and, and positive proposals that were put forward and ori originally agreed to by the Iranians to export the LEU and uh, support the Tehran research reactor deal. So uh, I, I just don't see that evidence. I think that we need to be planning for that eventuality simply because we can't predict the way uh, these sorts of things play out as we learn from both India and Pakistan. There may be drivers that force this regime to move forward more quickly that in fact produce a, a nuclear armed Iran uh, more quickly than we anticipate and we should be prepared for containment if and when that comes. That needs to be done quietly and discreetly, but that I would hope that planning is already underway. I do not see that as in any way in contrast or undercutting the very strenuous diplomacy that we've had, resetting the relationship with Russia, putting forward serious proposals toward the Iranians, and actually, I think, very quietly mobilizing at least some international support for the kinds of multilateral sanctions that would be effective. Because I think no one on this panel has said that sanctions should never be used, but simply that they need to be used only where and how that they, they are most effective. In terms of how that coordinates with our support for the Iranian opposition, I would say quite frankly that the Iranian opposition is a force that we neither created nor anticipated. And our support, while important because we are a moral leader, because we have a, a certain responsibility given our history, given our ideals, uh, to voice those sorts of ideas, mm 
our support is not going to be what changes the future for the Iranian opposition. Iran is a proud country that resents uh, the in interference of foreigners very deeply. It's 50 years later, they still deeply resent, as one of the other representatives suggested, the, the involvement with the Mossadegh affair in 53. I don't, I don't believe at this stage that uh, anything other than moral support for the opposition would be useful or welcomed from that side. And I do believe that that opposition, in fact, will succeed over time simply because it represents the, the view of the large swath of the Iranian people. Thank you. It, it, it's, it's a very, very important question. I, I detect through dealing with people in the National Security Council and, and elsewhere no resignation to the containment strategy. And in fact, I, I believe that uh, the good example here is the way we're dealing with the North Korea nuclearization problem. That is, we're going to find every diplomatic uh, and in the North Korean case, sanctions-based way to roll this back. So I detect a strategy that uh, on the one hand, counter to where I think we've been for the last decade, rejects the notion that there's an immediacy to the ability to apply increased pressure and then and then somehow arm twist the Iranians into changing their behavior. The new realism I detect in town now is that we know we're dealing with a very determined regime which has domestic, cultural, and other reasons to move only straight ahead with nuclear development. Now, how do we show them that that's a choice that has consequences without immediately imposing penalties? How do we hold before them a vision of be careful what you wish for when you get it as you deal in your neighborhood and as you deal in the rest of the global community? How do we find a way for them to, to match their own rhetoric with a, a responsible participation in the global community's concerns about nuclearization. I think the contingencies will be there for dealing with this, but I like the notion that this current approach sees a very, very long road ahead, and if the measures we don't take result in the desired turning back away from the program and an export of uranium, if they go nuclear, we have models for which to deal with that as we've executed in Libya and in North Korea. That is, in a sense, you're playing, if you excuse the sports analogy, we, we, we have a, a, a game plan as long as we're in regulation time, and we have a game plan if we have to go to overtime. I don't have much to add except that containment is the end of the process and we're still at the beginning. I, well, I, I think, first of all, it, you have to understand, it's perfectly logical for Iran to be pursuing nuclear weapons. They're surrounded by other nuclear powers. Um, uh, they, uh, a, a, and they're at a level of sophistication and capability which allows them to achieve a nuclear capability. Um, if, if, if Barack Obama or George W. Bush were elected president of Iran, they would be pr uh, pursuing a nuclear capability. Any leader in that geopolitical context would be. Uh, the question is, how, can you first of all, move toward a regime that's not threatening its neighbors ideologically or in others so that people are more relaxed about it, and secondly, create incentives and disincentives that persuade them that a nuclear capability is not in their interest. Um, we've already seen North Korea cross a nuclear threshold, and the current policies are to roll it back. Uh, and there are fairly massive sanctions that are under, under in place, and uh, also some fairly substantial inducements that are being offered to try to roll that back. So. Iran crossing the nuclear threshold is not necessarily the end of the world, and it doesn't mean even if it happens that you're going to live with it indefinitely or try to live with it indefinitely. One of the reasons for, as I've said, for substantial san and mounting sanctions against Iran is to persuade other countries they don't want to do the same thing. And so keeping Iran in its pariah status, even if it achieved nuclear weapons or nuclear capability, would be uh, sound policy. Uh, in my judgment. Um, so I, I don't think we should see an absolute deadline here. Uh, that said, we're not going to physically prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons any, by anything short of invasion and occupation. Bombing might delay it, uh, but not uh, indefinitely. Um, and uh, therefore, we're going to have to continue to pursue a track which involves mounting sanctions, continued engagement, um, and international solidarity. In, a, in an effort to arrest, slow, or eventually, if necessary, roll back this program. 
Thank you. Mr. Lutkemeyer. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the uh, <clears throat> witnesses for their testimony. It's been very uh, compelling. Um, I happen to have the opportunity to go to Israel back in August, and we uh, met with uh, our group, both the Democrats and Republicans, met with the uh, leadership both uh, there in uh, of Israel as well as Palestine, and they were adamant in their uh, analysis of the situation that Iran would have the nuclear capability by the end of the year. If that's the case, I think it's being very naive from the testimony we've heard this morning that we've got plenty of time with which to deal with this. Um, I think that uh, the sense of urgency is necessary in order to be able to uh, confront this, have a plan ready to confront it. Uh, I haven't heard that plan yet this morning. I've heard some ideas, but I haven't heard that plan. If we're going to be ready for this, we need to have the sense of urgency that we have the ability to contain this or deal with it, as the ambassador just said. Um, you know, one of the concerns I have is that, you know, sanctions are only part of one of the layers of ways to deal with this, and diplomacy is one of the ways. But the folks in the Middle East don't seem to be able to understand that with diplomacy comes commitment, and they don't seem to be willing to live up to commitments. We can get commitments from them, but they're just ignored. It's just a statement that they can throw away. There doesn't seem to be any willingness to, to, com to com uh, complete their commitment. And so, in that light, knowing we have a sense of urgency, knowing we have a difficult group to deal with, knowing that they probably, if don't have it already, will have very, very, very shortly nuclear capabilities, where do we need to go with our sanctions and our di diplomatic efforts? Uh, because if we get another North Korea, which ignores diplomacy, which ignores the international community, how do we deal with those folks? Ambassador, would you like to start? Well, I think, first of all, I think that deadlines and a sense of urgency may tend to work against us rather than for us. They don't feel a sense of urgency. If we feel a sense of urgency, then we're the ones under the gun. We're the ones who are constantly pressured to come up with new ideas, new proposals, uh, new diplomatic offers. Yeah, but don't um, you feel I, we need to be ahead of the curve on this? Don't you feel we, need to, we don't need to be, don't be proactive rather than reactive? I'm not arguing that we shouldn't be. I am arguing that we need a sustainable policy, a policy that, that will continue to um, penalize Iran, will continue to uh, make it uh, uh, over the longer term unattractive for Iran to either gain or retain a nuclear capability. We need to maintain an uh, international consensus which uh, isolates Iran and penalizes them in that regard. Uh, and to the extent we um, become fixated on a particular deadline, um, we, we are the ones who then become under pressure uh, we're the ones who are then um, uh, find our position weakened by that kind of time pressure. So I, I, I understand the apparent urgency. Now, I'm not sure you said the Israelis thought they'd have a nuclear weapon by the end of the year. I don't know what year that refers to. This year. Well, they're certainly not going to have one by the end of this year. So I think we can dismiss that possibility. I don't think they're likely to have a nuclear weapon by the end of next year either. Well, um, with all due respect, uh, Mr. Ambassador, here's an article from the Times uh, online, December 14th, that secret document exposes New uh, Iran's nuclear trigger. Uh, they have their final component of the nuclear bomb. They're working on it as we speak. But if, if, Iran, if Iran has nuclear materials for a weapon, they have a facility we don't know about and can't bomb because we don't know it exists and we don't know where it is. So if Iran could develop a nuclear weapon at this point, they would do it in a way that we would have absolutely no way of stopping unless we invade and occupy the entire country. Um, the, 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 the uranium they do have, which we know about, is not capable of, develop, of, of creating a bomb and wouldn't be capable of creating a bomb for several years because it requires extensive further enrichment, which the Iranians do not at, at the present have the capability of doing, but which they could do over an extended period of time. So it's possible they have nuclear material we don't know about, but if so, then our options are pretty limited. Well, not, not to belabor the point, but uh, Dr. Maloney made the point uh, in her testimony that uh, gave at least two examples where we had underestimated what was going on in Iran. And I, to me, if, if, we've, if we've already underestimated twice, it would seem logical that <clears throat> it's very possible we, we underestimated them again. And, and this, when you're dealing with a nuclear bomb and, and a regime such as that, to underestimate those folks is, is very, very dangerous. Um, anybody else like to comment on the, the discussion? 
You also posed in your question um, the idea of where do we go next, and I think that needs to be the focus of, of the deliberation at this stage, and particularly with respect to IRPSA. Where we go next is not more unilateral measures that have limited or counterproductive impact within Iran. Where we go next is to the UN Security Council, test how successful we've been in changing the dynamic with the Russians, test how serious the Chinese are, as they've suggested, at least in some rhetoric, about applying new pressure to Iran, and test the Europeans and see if they're finally willing for perhaps the first time since the revolution to, to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to Iran. I think that's the route that we go. And we will not succeed fully, but I think that we can have some real impact in crafting the kind of measures that, as Robin suggested, have already begun to make important elites within Iran, people who really do have some influence over the future of its policies on core security issues, stand up and take notice. And that's the sort of thing that can pay off but it will take time. I appreciate your, your responses, and I would love to ask more questions, especially with regards to how in the world we can get the rest of the world to go along with us on half the world sides with Iran right now. But I realize my time's out. I uh, appreciate the uh, Chairman's indulgence. Thank you. I, I just have one, one brief thought. I, um, implicit in your statement is some knowledge that we have about where Iran is. And the bottom line is, if you think we knew too little about what was going on in Iraq, try Iran, we know even less, and that's a sobering reality when it comes to figuring out down the road. But I will also say that if you thought Iraq was a complicated war, try Iran. That the military option is not just an issue of using strategic bombing of suspected targets, uh, which would clearly backfire and clearly galvanize the population around the regime, however much they hate it. Uh, uh, but would, because of the nature of conflict and our own deployment of troops in both neighboring Iraq and Afghanistan, force the United States to engage in something that was far broader and would look like an open-ended war with Iran. So I think that, that when we talk about these options, yes, sanctions are frustrating, uh, um, that the military option is one that is so costly and we make such assumptions about being able to go in and it having some impact that that could be in, in many ways the worst thing to do because it would also encourage people to think they need the bomb to protect themselves. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lukemeyer, I, I can offer two things. Uh, you weren't uh, yet a member of this committee uh, last session when we had a hearing on uh, the war gaming of just what would be entailed in uh, having a, a, a military response and what would be the ramifications. So uh, the committee staff would be more than willing to uh, make those materials available for you if you think they're useful at all, the testimony of the various witnesses on that. I think there were graphs and charts and all of that. Uh, the other thing is that you might find it useful, although I, I suspect we're a little late for the vote today, uh, you might find it useful uh, if we can arrange for the Intelligence Committee to give you a briefing on what it is that we do know. I mean, I think everybody acknowledges we don't know everything on that, but it's just as dangerous to overestimate their you know, capacity to just to underestimate that. Uh, and if uh, you want to arrange that directly, it's fine. If we can be helpful in that, uh, we'll certainly try to do that with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, do you have any more questions? Yeah. Go right ahead. Uh, Mr. Mr. Flake. But just one. I wouldn't, uh, ran out of time before I could ask Ambassador Dobbins first and maybe the others if they want to comment. Uh, with regard to, uh, and I think all of you in your statements have mentioned the advisability if we are going to move down the sanctions route, economic sanctions route, of international cooperation and getting our allies on board. Does it make it more difficult or do we help by leading, uh, imposing our own unilateral sanctions? Uh, and, and there may be a mix of both, I understand. But let's take today's action in the House uh, with, with IRPSA. Is it does this complicate uh, the, the likelihood of, of getting our international allies uh, on board on other perhaps more effective sanctions or some variant of these sanctions? How does that impact us moving ahead? Um, the fact that we're going to impose these in the House, Senate may not go there. It may look different in conference, I, I understand. But, but I just want to talk to the advisability of, of leading on this. Um, is it something that our international partners are looking for our guidance on, or is it more useful? And I tend to think, and I want to see if you agree, to move in concert with them. Um, so, Ambassador Dobbins. I think that, um, that, that, that the, the element of the bill that uh, 
that uh, you face, as I understand it, um, uh, that uh, would disrupt international solidarity and make agreement more difficult are, is the extraterritorial elements, the effort to use U.S. law to impose sanctions on foreign companies for doing something that's perfectly legal in their own country and perfectly legal internationally. Um, and to the extent we have, we've done that in the past and we've ended up uh, backing away from it because of the virulently uh, 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 negative reaction of our closest allies to being uh, manipulated in that fashion. If I can interrupt for a minute. It, within ERPSA, that is precisely what we're doing. Right. Is it not? Exactly. All right. uh, Dr. Lopez, do you have a comment on no, that? No, I'm, I'm in agreement with you on this. And I, and, and I think I just aired two layers to this. One is in terms of the multilateral versus unilateral dynamic, it needs to be more widely understood in the Congress how the Russians and the Chinese share very much our view that a nuclear Iran is in no one's interest. Mm -hmm. And if we believe we have to march down the road of leading with economic coercion so that we persuade the Russians and the Chinese, we're already on, this, on the same plane on this. And I, and I think that's what pushes us to think about more astute arrangements than are, than are built into this legislation. Secondly, um, I, I believe we have a, a new era of good feeling around the Security Council table that's been hard earned over the last two years. And, and that um, concerns, particularly in this town, that the Security Council is either inept or uh, the environment is not right there for us. In fact, within this week, I think the U.S. has shown remarkable leadership in the Security Council in the reformulation of the 1267 guidelines with Russian and Chinese partners. I think we're at a unique moment in which the multilateral may need to lead the domestic. And we'd be much better off in a technical sense saying the United States has in its holster, if you will, a set of punishing sanctions, but because our highest order priority is changing Iranian behavior in concert with its region and in concert with the globe, we're keeping that powder dry. But it's very clear what we can do technically and economically, but at this moment we choose not to because we believe this is a global concern of which we're pleased to play a part. Dr. Maloney. Let me just add one final point. Under IPSA, as I understand it, currently formulated without flexibility or waiver authority, we would have to sanction Chinese companies. And if you think that's going to make it easy to bring the Chinese on board with the kind of sanctions at the Security Council that would actually have an impact in Iran, you know, I think there's some obvious conflict there. The Chinese have a, an enormous interest in investment in Iran, and if we can in any way encourage them or coerce them to use that leverage with Iran, that will be far more valuable. They are unlikely to do that if we are involved in the business of sanctioning their energy firms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Foster, you're recognized for five minutes. Oh, well, thank you. And, and my apologies for not um, being present at, uh, at all of your testimony here. But I'm, I'm specifically interested in the possibilities for further micro-targeting of financial sanctions um, towards different segments of, of, of society that might actually provide us with some leverage to try to encourage the developments that we want to happen in, in government there. And, um, you know, obvious targets would be, you know, individual institutions and, and you know, banks um, or maybe part, sections of the ruling class that might realize that their hold on power is, a, you know, a little bit shaky and they may be shoveling their assets offshore um, or elements that we think might be friendly towards developments we want to encourage and making their, um, their financial lives easier. And I was wondering if there are anything, anything that we're missing, anything Congress can do to encourage or enable that sort of, of you know, better targeting of, of financial sanctions. I'm willing to, to respond. I, I think uh, this particular leadership in Treasury has examined those in detail, and I have great confidence in uh, uh, Mr. Levy, uh, Levy for, for knowing where that is. And, and there's been a number of discussions, as you know, about that. I, I think the focus of this should be on, on those entities which, whose activities is most suspicious in violation of the UN Security Council resolutions passed in 07 and 08, 
which restricted higher levels technologies and the movement of monies to support the nuclear program. I think uh, both with the revelations that the Congressman has noted earlier uh, of, of the possibility of trigger devices, uh, the movement of scientists, et cetera, I think we have possibilities of looking into new areas where this kind of micro-targeting would be very effective. It, it, it has a combination of sending a very, very strong message that our intelligence is, is state of the art, uh, that there are ways in which we're trying to focus on the nature of the problem, which is nuclear development and not the whole economy. And it also has the ability to be taken off very quickly if we need to reward compliant behavior. Well. And I just add to that, I think in addition to micro-targeting and looking for the most important constituencies within the regime to influence, we also need to think about the way that we're implementing sanctions. And one of the, I think, existing holes, and it's well known, is, is Iranian uh, economic interests in Dubai. Um, to the extent that we can get the UAE, but Dubai Emirate in particular, to step up its scrutiny and make its uh, financial transactions with the Iranians more difficult, that will have, I think, some significant impact on the regime elites who currently support the nuclear strategy. Yeah, is there any, um, any knowledge in, any detailed knowledge about um, segments of, of Iranian society moving their assets um, offshore into places where we might or might not be able to see. And um, you know, there's a lot of things happening in the financial services uh, bill that is intended to give us leverage to pry open places like Switzerland. And I was just wondering if, if that is a source of, of frustration and understanding you know, what's really going on there and where we could apply leverage. There's been an enormous drain of capital uh, in Iran by both people in the regime and others. Uh, as Suzanne mentioned, Dubai is now uh, fueled, its economy is fueled significantly by the inflow of Iranian businesses that have basically set up shop there to get around sanctions. So they bring their goods or whatever their office is involved in uh, to Dubai, running out, out of Dubai, and then they ship things uh, across the Gulf or use that as their, you know, their backup office. Uh, but Dubai at the moment is also looking for any source of income it can get. And so, you know, it's um, how much pressure we can actually put on Dubai is very tricky. Okay. Well, well thank you. And my apologies again for only covering part of this and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Lukemeyer, do you have any further questions? Uh, yeah, I just got one, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we've talked about the opposition uh, many times. How strong is the opposition? How well organized is it? Uh, where do you feel that it's going to uh, grow to? Uh, the, the, there's been a reform movement that has been vibrant since the early 90s in Iran. It, it took root officially with the election of President Khatami in 1997, but it never had um, critical mass. Today it does, and it crosses all sectors of society. You have people who were among the original revolutionaries as well as people who've never been involved in politics and hate the system. Uh, it has, you know, all aspects of, um, of societal life. When you see, uh, as I had some of the slides, I think, before you arrived, of, of women old and young, you have um, taxi drivers as well as professionals. This is something where everyone's been affected. And I know we talk a lot about the Revolutionary Guards and kind of lump them together. But you, one of the things you need to remember is that even within the military, including the Revolutionary Guards, there is dissent. Uh, in 1997, the Iranian polls found that 84 percent of the Revolutionary Guards voted for President Khatami, the reform president, uh, that every young man has to do service in the military. And many opt to do the Revolutionary Guards because their training is better, it helps get them entry to university, and most of all because they, let, they get off at 2.30 in the afternoon and then the, the young men can go off and get a second job, as many young men have to do to support their families in this bad economy. And so um, we need to be very careful in looking at lumping any sector of society in one basket. Uh, there are even significant, confirmable reports that from some of the housing compounds from the Revolutionary Guards, there were people shouting from the rooftops at night, you know, Allahu Akbar and down with the system and so forth. What, what percentage of the people do you believe either belong to or, or strongly support uh, the, these efforts? 
I would be dishonest if I told you I had an exact number, but I think that there are vast numbers uh, you know, who either support the opposition, are disillusioned with the regime in, because of their treatment of, of Iranian society over the last six months. Uh, do I think it's the majority? I can't honestly tell you, but I think okay. that to brave the kind of um, repercussions, whether it's going to jail, facing torture, potential rape, uh, and that people still get out on the streets, still engage in civil disobedience in, in very imaginative ways is stunning, and there's nothing like it any place else in the world today. Okay, if you made an excellent point with regards to uh, if some of the sanctions that we put on them would hurt the people in this, this, this group, and they're very uh, uh, you know, politically uh, oriented toward uh, their own, own world and, and very defensive and very protective of it, uh, what do you think, if, if, if we could have them write our policy, what would they like to see us do to hurt the regime and yet uh, be able not to hurt their people? What do you think suggestions would be from them? Well, as I tried to suggest earlier, I think that, that you, the one common denominator among all three layers or categories of activism is a desire to see the regime pay the price, the specific individuals, the Revolutionary Guard leadership, the Basij, the, young, the head of the young mili religious vigilantes. Um, uh, but they also know that there are lots of little loopholes so that in the case of an individual who may be sanctioned, his kid may be in Europe in school. Um, that, you know, there are, the, the head of household may be affected by the limitations, but the, it doesn't affect their broader life and the ability of them to generate you know, um, players in society down the road. Uh, so they're interested in seeing us support human rights issues, give greater attention, acknowledge what's happening without saying, you know, we're going to allocate $400 million to support the Iranian opposition. That's not what they're looking for. In fact, they don't want any American money for fear that it will taint them. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Flake. I said one, one other question. Uh, Dr. Wright had mentioned that and others have mentioned the more effective um, sanctions or, or efforts to disrupt the regime or impact them have been financial banking regulations. Uh, OFAC, our Office of Foreign Assets Control, currently does that. Do they need any more authorization or authority from Congress to do things that they aren't doing now? I, I would like to see them be more active, for example, not you know, chase more Americans with suntans you know, coming back from, from Cuba and in rather <laughs> do what uh, might uh, benefit us more. Do they need author more authority from the U.S. Uh, Congress in that regard? Dr. Maloney, do you have thoughts on that? Or I, I think in contrast, the, the Treasury Department has been very creative in using the existing authority, and particularly the, some of the regulations passed after 9-11 that specifically target financial support for terrorism and, not, and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and using those kinds of measures uh, in ways that they probably weren't originally envisioned to target Iran, to make it more difficult for Iran to continue to do business with the international community. The, the big dilemma of, of applying pain to Iran is that as long as they sell oil, they're, they're making tens of billions of dollars a year as a regime. And, and I don't think that there is currently international support for a, a full-fledged oil embargo on Iran. Mm -hmm. um, but we can make what they do more difficult, more painful, and more expensive. And to the extent that we do that, it tends to hurt those who have some influence over regime policy. But uh, OFAC has the authority that they need. To I think that they've, they've got a lot, and they've used it very well lately. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one of the interesting things is uh, in, in Treasury, they have a, uh, quite a um, defined list of play, the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard, uh, other people on that, that uh, from which we could choose sanctions on, and they've refined it uh, quite well to move forward on that. Let me just ask uh, one, one last question for me uh, to, to Ms. Wright, who I, I say your, your slideshow was great. Thank you very much. This is a, a bill that was filed yesterday or today uh, that would seek to remove from sanctions in Iran uh, technology like Twitter or Google or things like that uh, for non-governmental uh, aspects on that. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, what impact would it have? Would it be favorably disposed toward it or not? I think the opposition would, f would be s stunned and pleased uh, that the Congress was enlightened enough to understand something like that. Uh, the regime would probably use it for its own ends, 
but if it would actually, and I don't know the answer to this question, if it would actually change the accessibility of technology to the opposition. This has been uh, one of the big obstacles. Just like the revolution in 1979 was the most modern revolution in the, in the use of the fax machine and the tape cassette, what these kids have done is really unbelievable. Uh, given they don't have the same kind of access that we do and how they've gotten around the bans by the government. Uh, so it's a, it's a very creative idea. I didn't mean to imply for our other three panelists that they couldn't Twitter or Google uh, on that, <laughs> just that you, you had done the presentation. I thought that you probably, uh, with your background, had a, a better insight into it. Uh, are there any members of our panel who uh, have a comment uh, that they want to share with us? They feel that um, they won't have told us all that they need to tell us before they leave if we don't uh, cover that area. Well, then I want to thank all of you very, very much. You're terrific witnesses. You helped us uh, get a focus on this, and we appreciate your time and your, your information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. just sounds kind of weird. Why? I mean, I bet I could set him on the right path to becoming a gentleman. Just when you get home, don't make him rub lotion on your feet. <laughs> Tends to stick with the person. <laughs> some Yoda. Meet the Browns. See brand new episodes tomorrow at 10. Only on TBS. Very funny. Brought to you by Old Navy. Lying here dreaming Nothing much has changed with season Except I'm just waiting Because a bathroom can be more than just a bathroom.